Good morning from San Francisco. This is Patrick McGee, tech correspondent in San Francisco. And uh, we're going to have a 30 minute wide ranging discussion on uh, the future of retail, direct to consumer trends, the rise of e-commerce, and how brands can position themselves with two executives from Genpact. So let's just start in the most basic sense of just defining where we are, because of course, you know, e-commerce goes back to the 1990s and Amazon's been dominant for a while. Direct consumer, I don't know exactly where you'd put the establishment there, but I mean, you know, Warby Parker was 2010. It's sort of already come full circle, has its own stores that are, you know, prominent and successful. Uh, Away Luggage would maybe be another big brand that I've seen. Uh, Casper, I think, has had ups and downs. But the point is, is like a lot of this has already been happening, has already uh, established itself. I have to mention Shopify, I suppose, if we're talking about e-commerce and sort of the, the non-Amazon route that companies have taken. And I sort of think like if it's 2021 and you don't have a D2C uh, or e-commerce strategy, aren't you kind of doomed at this point? Like, like I, I'm, I'm thinking maybe the problem of me saying that is that I'm sort of treating strategy like something fixed rather than something ever evolving and in need of, you know, the likes of Genpack to, to, to help me stay on my toes. But um, can you just give me a sense of like, where are we? What sort of ending are we in? Have we only scratched the surface of D2C and e-commerce? Um, or is it feeling like, you know, the giants today are, are going to be the same giants in 10, 10 or 20 years? So, you know, uh, my feeling is I would still put us in kind of third or fourth inning of a nine inning game, Pat. Um, you know, certainly all the stories you told of uh, kind of the rise of marketplaces like Amazon, that's kind of old news. And frankly, you know, even where we are in the COVID pandemic, I think the explosive growth of e-commerce more broadly across the last couple of years is kind of old news. I mean, I think most people expect, uh, you know, in a couple of years, you're going to see six trillion dollars globally about 25 percent of the world's retail sales going through e-commerce direct to consumer talking about only direct sales to consumers from manufacturers uh kind of still in earlier stages there's certainly a lot of kind of born in the cloud vertically integrated players like the ones you mentioned a warby parker a bonobos etc many of whom are actually to your point going omni-channel now but I think what's happening over the last couple of years is that uh, you're seeing a, an expansion in, into new sectors. So whereas, you know, kind of high brand players of destination purchases like fashion, apparel companies, consumer electronics, you know, they're quite advanced, as you said. And, you know, the leaders might be approaching 25, 35 percent of their revenues over over uh, uh, direct to consumer e-commerce channels. But, you know, there's some historical laggards out there, you know, spaces like food and beverage. Uh, hardware, consumer health, these are kind of more market baskets that you just buy, uh, you know, in, in a package. And, and historically, they were slower. But but now uh, we're seeing even that uh, grow pretty significantly, about 20 uh, percent growth in, in uh, 2021. And, uh, you know, kind of 75 percent of consumers saying they've bought groceries uh, online in the last year um, and, and, and that indeed their their uh, purchasing patterns are likely to be sustainable, even as we totally emerge from the covid uh, pandemic. And I, I really don't want COVID to dominate the discussion, but it probably is just worth just a quick question on COVID. I mean, how how impactful has COVID been on these trends and to what extent you, you expect it to be long lasting versus, uh, you know, a, a return to some new normal uh, as, as, as soon as, uh, you know, vaccines are available to the entire population. And I know some people might say they're already available. I, you know, anyone with kids knows that they're not fully available yet. Uh, and yeah. so we're not we're yeah. not at a new normal anytime soon until that happens. Well, yeah, I can I can take a stab at that. And the it, it's the uh, the way that we think about the COVID uh, situation, specifically on direct to consumer and digital commerce, is the great acceleration, right? And that is a lot of these uh, trends, like going direct to consumer, investing in digital, omni-channel. They've been things that we've been talking about, especially folks like Alex and I, for years. But we've seen such a massive adoption, really a, a, a forced adoption. In, in uh, consumers having to engage via digital, that we feel like the time the time is now, right? There's been people have been investing in it. Um, I think people have become companies have become much more sophisticated with the services and and capabilities that they offer. But this is definitely here to stay. I mean, think about the level of convenience that a lot of customers and humans, just like us, have all engaged in over the past year and a half on. Um, the buy online, pick up in store and getting whatever you want from whatever marketplace you want and returning the things that you don't need. Once customers can feel that convenience, there's really no returning from that. I think we're now reaching this uh, really fever pitch of digital adoption that I think is only going to get more mature as the time goes on. 
Okay, so if we talk specifically about consumer packaged goods companies, could you, uh, maybe we'll start with Alex, just go through what are the aspirations? What are, are the challenges for making this transition? Maybe I can best uh, illustrate this through the story of one of our clients who's a very large food and beverage player. And as I said, that's a, a relatively late to the market sector um, as far as DTC is concerned. And, you know, they've set an aspiration of perhaps getting uh, to, you know, 5 to 10% of their revenues eventually coming direct. Um, but as I said, these are low price products, typically part of a market basket. It's unlikely you're going to go to their site. You're going to be going perhaps to an intermediary in most cases. So what they've done is they've really focused on specialized products that are that are tailored just for the direct to consumer channel. So customized assortments, colors, flavors, add ons, making it your own as a customer, giving the consumer the ability to have a different experience than they could have during the tip uh, the, through the typical retail channel, right? And the real objective that they've got is really data capture and innovation. So it's an invaluable opportunity for them to learn directly from the consumer what's hot, and that enables them to innovate more rapidly, bring line extensions to the market much more quickly, right? And also, of course, they can kind of go direct and increase their realized price on those specialized products by as much as 10x and provide some uh, investment to just defray the innovation costs. I think the challenge is there's a lot of complexity. It's a totally different business model than pumping a lot of standardized SKUs through a wholesale uh, and retail channel, right? And so uh, really where we're helping them is setting up and orchestrating all kinds of separate uh, end-to-end processes. It's not, it's not so much about the front end, the website, the mobile app. Um, as you said, people have been doing that for kind of 20 years. But getting your financial systems and processes uh, set up correctly to report and track uh, direct-to-consumer e-commerce, getting your supply chain to work properly, particularly in, you know when you have things like reverse uh, logistics and uh, you know batch manufacturing instead of uh, your typical way, and also support for more demanding customers who you know have a higher price point and custom product. We're providing single pane of glass order management that help customer care people give those direct consumer clients uh, and customers the service that they uh, expect. I imagine companies that are making these sort of plays are are getting data in a certain sense for for the first time, right? I mean, are they, maybe this is too general a question. I'm sure you have, uh, you know, answers that that cross the spectrum. But, you know, generally, are companies sort of drowning in data without much idea of what to do with it? Or are they, you know, leveraging it and, and, and thriving? Companies have been drowning in data, I think, for for recent, recent memory. I think it's Data availability is not, has not been the problem. The ability to, to harness that data, to harvest that data, to make sense of it and to make better decisions, I think, is continues to be an ongoing challenge. And especially with adoption and where data can come from with the Internet of Things and the fact that literally every physical object in our house and where we live and where we work can all be connected. The exhaust from that is data and data can be overwhelming to organizations. So. We feel like that's, but at the same point in time, the other side of that coin is data is is the way through to deliver experiences and efficiencies that are competitively unique and memorable for the customers that you serve. Um, you know, uh, Patrick, one of the things that I wanted to share with, uh, within this world is, you know, you mentioned some of the challenges that direct-to-consumer or, you know, consumer packaged goods companies are having in this world. And if I were to sum that up, uh, we're seeing a, a, a massive shift in mindset. And it's the mindset of, consumer goods companies who are thinking brand first and are able to shift to demand first. And what I mean by that is brand first is really think about it in terms of a large portfolio of brands that are really uh, thinking in their specific silo. So thinking like vertically oriented, how can I get my brand into the hands of the most people? And then across that portfolio, it can be a bit overwhelming. We see a lot of organizations really kind of making that, that turn by organizing teams across brands, cross-functionally and thinking across the portfolio to really meet not uh, customers in terms of the brand uh, opportunity, but really in what we're calling demand spaces. So think of a demand space in terms of, you know, customers are, and just like us, we're buying products and services based on need and occasion. A specific demand space, I have three young kids, could be movie night at the Edmonds house. It could be making dinner at night. It could be commuting back when I used to commute all the time. And uh, organizations that are really able to think first, like think in terms of those journeys, and then align their brands to make sense at, at that specific point in need, I think are making a massive impact. Um, really quickly, one example of that that I think is fascinating, and this is from someone who is challenged when it comes to uh, making dinner for my family, uh, is the pasta company uh, Barilla 
who recently partnered with Spotify to help people such as me who mess up cooking pasta all the time. And what they've done is they've, they've, they've created tailored uh, uh, playlists that are hyper-focused on the specific pasta that you're making. So rather than leave it up to the timer or your internal timer to nail that you know, perfect uh, spaghetti or uh, penne pasta, they've created like culturally relevant, amazing playlists that depending on the specific pasta you want to make, as long as you follow the direction and take it out right when the song is up, it's pasta cooked to perfection every time. And that's such a good example of not thinking in terms of pasta first, but think in terms of people like me who struggle in making amazing meals for their family on the day to day. So wait, that sounds neat. I'll have to try it. But how, how have they monetized that? When you combine multiple interface mechanisms, so like you've got your app, mobile app open while you're using the product or while you're visiting the store, that enables you to capture behavioral information on the, uh, from the consumer. And then you can actually serve up customized e-commerce offerings to them or even customized product assortments to them. And that's really how... Um, these are being monetized. Uh, there's a lot of data from some of our clients showing that when they actually get consumers interacting with these channels simultaneously, their lifetime value goes up. And so they see a very direct return. Um, I want to uh, get more questions through the audience. And so the way to do that is to ask the ones that have already come in, right? And then, and then speaking of engagement, right? This is how people get uh, engaged. So uh, first, the questions is, uh, do you think uh, companies can be successful purely with direct to consumer? Or does everyone need to move in the direction of omni-channel offerings? Yeah, I, I, my point of view on that, and Alex would love to hear yours as well, is it's it's all dependent on on the company, right? I don't live in a world of absolutes where there's one right size, you know, fits all. But what what we see is companies who are able to think across channels are typically better positioned to deliver value and efficiency and delight to the people who they serve. So I would I would put my eggs in the basket of omni-channel. And one of the things that, that that we've observed in some of the primary research that we've done over the past, I'd say six to eight months, is really coming up with specific personas on how people shop both online and in person and how different those experiences truly are. So the way that we've compartmentalized that is this difference between stocking up and seeking out. So stocking up, we'll, we'll call for this conversation the stocker. Those are people who really shop in person and think of like the big box retailers like Costco. If you're like me, what you're doing is you're going to Costco and you're literally stocking up on these essential items, whether it's protein bars or bottled water or pretzels, whatever your fix. And then on the other end of the equation, you have seeking out. It was one of my colleagues was telling me a story the other day about when his wife purchased a black shirt recently, she did so online. And rather than buy one specific shirt, she went to seven different retailers and ordered seven different shirts and ended up returning, you know, four or five of them. And the so what of that is you think about like those personas, whether it's seeking out and engaging what's called bracketing, which is buying a whole bunch of things and returning most of them or stocking up, those are so different. And organizations that are able to think about their channels and experiences that accommodate both those different personas, I think are in a really unique position to succeed. So you guys just knowing, you know, the volumes and margins of various businesses pretty well, what, what, what do you think of like the sort of I don't know, repercussions of, of that decision, because isn't the person purchasing those shirts, trying them all on and then sending them all back? Like, isn't it sort of economically uh, inefficient, right? Because the companies are having to pay the shipping both ways, presumably, and a bit of an environmental disaster if you're doing that at scale? Uh, it actually turns out that it's, it's the smaller scale players have the most difficulty uh, with mm -hmm. the economics. I'll leave the, the environmental impact aside, but typically, right, your supply chain and fulfillment costs, including returns, you know, could run two to four times higher than working through a wholesale channel, typical retailer, right? And so you really need to get to a tipping point, perhaps, you know, for a scale player, as much as 20% of your sales going through a direct channel to have that virtuous cycle of the, the higher margins right on the sales start to outweigh some of the uh, the distribution costs that you mentioned. Um, right. Your, your, your comment on environmental, uh, the uh, environmental impact, I think is really interesting one that we can't necessarily just gloss over the, don't quote me on this statistic, but it was at least a couple of years ago, I remember reading about the number of returns that are received by retailers roughly 50% of those returns end up at landfills. 
And to me, that is like such a massive, not only problem, but also opportunity for companies to think about how to streamline that value chain. So to think about the reverse logistics and the impact on, on, uh, on, on uh, the environment, challenges for sure. But in those challenges, could there be opportunities? Could there are some interesting startups coming up with points of view on how to be that intermediary and take those returned items and offer those up in uh, multi-sided marketplaces? So I think there's something interesting about where there is uh, very challenging business uh, uh, issues. There is also a ripe opportunity for disruption and for innovation. Just very quickly, one example of that would be a, a company like Loop, which basically is experimenting with reusable packaging that you know goes back to the manufacturer, gets refilled and returned to you. Yeah, so I was going to mention a, a similar one. I haven't heard of Loop. This The one that I have heard of, and I haven't used it, but it's called Olive. Is, is this well known as one of the co-founders of Jet started up this company? So basically, I think they sort of aggregate certain of your purchases, right, from a variety of brands. And then they would send it on like a dedicated day. And it, it comes in a two-way container that you send back. So they effectively are, are getting rid of the plastic and the cardboard. And, you know, never mind the returns example that, that, that Mike gave. I mean, just the amount of stuff that we get through Amazon like when we do our recycling every Tuesday, like I, it's almost yeah. shameful how much cardboard can pile up uh, from all these purchases, right? And maybe a bunch of that is happening, even if you're going to Walmart or what have you, uh, and it's just sort of hidden from you. But but nevertheless, it, it certainly doesn't feel like this is the sustainable, like great way to do this. Um, and so I don't know if there's sort of like a category of maybe like non-tech platforms that are, you know, uh, encouraging you to think more sustainably rather than think in terms of, you know, the two-day convenience uh, of things arriving. Is, is, I don't know, is that, a, is that a, a, a growing field or are Loop and Olive isolated examples that aren't representational? It's a growing field. I've, I've seen it. It's not only, I, I would say in recent memory, like, Five or so years ago, I think a lot of organizations, at least companies that we partner with, um, sustainability has been on their minds, but it's been kind of difficult to see how sustainability has been put in practice. I think what, what, what we see now is I think companies are more aware of why people care about it. And the fact that consumers, whether they're millennials or Gen Zs, are making purchase decisions based on brands that stand for something. Therefore, brands like Patagonia, for instance, when you make these big stands around you know, we're not going to participate in specific, uh, you know, shopping holidays because we need to make sure that, you know, sustainability is top of mind. That makes a difference at point of engagement and point of sale. So I would say sustainability is not just a buzzword these days. Companies are taking it seriously and are actually weaving it into the fabric of how they go to market. Let me go to another one. Someone wants to ask about payment platforms, which is that buy now, pay later schemes have, have done uh, really well and sort of, you know, like a multi-billion dollar valuation. The person just wants to know, do e-commerce platforms need these schemes to survive in the future? Uh, maybe I'll go to Alex for that. Yeah, I mean, my, look, uh, the buy now, pay later or divide into, you know, multiple payments is actually a relatively old uh, offering. In fact, in many, many countries where, you know, credit cards are more difficult and complicated to get, that's uh, a purchase uh, option that's been available at the retailer for many years. You know, I think what's what's nice now is that there's so many uh, startups and, and players who basically made adding that to your buying experience easy that it kind of becomes a needed to play uh, feature relatively soon, in, in my view. Although, you know, I think it's share relative to just typical credit card uh, purchasing in, in the U.S. context, you know, is probably going to be, you know, relatively low for a while. Mike, can I ask you, and apologies if this is too broad a question, but what do companies get wrong when they're trying to deploy these strategies? Like, are there certain things that you're always correcting with a, you know, a variety of clients, but it's the, same, it's the same challenge and they're doing it the wrong way? Yeah, I think if, if I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer that question in a little bit of a different way, which is I, I don't think companies are getting it wrong. I think companies have really significant challenges. And I think some companies are aware of those challenges and navigate appropriately. I think some of them, unfortunately, can be caught flat-footed. Now, some of the challenges that we think of when we're thinking about just broader transformation, whether it's the shift from brand to demand or omni-channel digital transformation, you have things like channel complexity, like aligning on specifically how channels work in unison and work together and the peoples and process and platforms all work together behind those channels or channels that compete with each other. That I've seen a lot of companies get into a significant spin and, 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 uh, you know, slowing down time to market based on just not having channel 
uh, clarity defined. Um, another option or another challenge that I see a lot of people run into is really having a clear strategy in terms of online business models. You have direct to consumer, you have business to business, you have business to business to consumer, you have multi-sided marketplaces. There is no shortage of growth models and digital business models that companies can adhere to. But oftentimes, clarifying what and why and what that vision looks like is not done first. Therefore, you see a lot of companies with fits and starts and not necessarily being unified behind a cohesive strategy. Um, the last bucket that I would say is uh, uh, a bucket of decentralized operations and fragmented technology. So oftentimes, like these, these change and these, these, these transformation issues come down to people and how people work, right? If you can have, it goes back to the first one around channel complexity. If you can have incentives and attribution across people and brands clearly defined, organizations typically all have their paddles in the same direction and are able to move quickly. When it comes to how people work across fragmented technology, it is to say that the amount of technology options and platforms these days is overwhelming is like the uh, understatement so far in this you know 25 minute conversation. So having a clear strategy that aligns to business models and then letting technology work for you in a way that's loosely coupled. So where you're not completely wetting yourself to one platform, but you have a services layer that allows you to really plug and play. If, if companies can get through those three challenges, typically they are better positioned to move with speed and with purpose. So can you give me the opposite then? What, what's, what's a company uh, either that you've worked with or that you've read about uh, or just, just know that has executed you know, extremely well and has lessons to offer? Yeah. So one of the things that I'm really excited about, this, this kind of gets into one of the themes we're preparing for today is um, the coming together of content, commerce and community. Right. And those are three buzzwords. I was at Internet Retailer or uh, it's uh, now called Retail X in Chicago a couple of weeks ago. And this was one of the main themes that really a lot of people were talking about is how to bring together content experiences, commerce experiences and communities into cohesive experiences. Now, one example that I would use that's really caught my eye here is Nike. And Nike since, has been doing direct to consumer since 2011. Um, the business has grown to around you know, $12.5 billion operation, which is significant. There's no surprise that Nike continues to do well and has done well, even through all the challenges of the pandemic. But one really good example of their ability to think across channels, to have the right direct to consumer strategy that you know, operates the right business models and to have technology and operations working together, is their announcement they made a few months ago around something called uh, Nothing But Gold. And nothing but gold is it's still in production, so it's not it's not fully live. It's in the process of being produced. Nothing but gold is a new kind of shopping app that's dedicated to sport, style, and self care. What that means is it's 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 basically uh, a niche community focused on uh, younger females who I quote for girls who want to do it their own way, just want to do it their own way. Now, what that means is. Social commerce is everywhere, right? People are, are engaging and buying on Instagram and TikTok and Facebook and everything in between. And Nike is one of those brands that rather than work exclusively in those social media business models, which I think a lot of us could agree, don't necessarily have our best intentions in mind all the time. They've created their own community of younger athletic females whose purpose is to inspire and to uplift each other. They're able to gain first party data on how uh, those uh, around how that community wants to work together, how to personalize experiences and how to create content that uplifts. And then the exhaust of that is they've created the movie or they've created a community where they can sell more shirts and shoes. So to me, that's a really interesting way of bringing people together, bringing people together around a purpose, being clear on how that purpose aligns to their strategy and then using data to drive conversions and engagement. I wanted to riff off the challenge issue. Um, we haven't really touched uh so much on marketplaces uh, in the context of this conversation. But I think what we found, again, with a number of our consumer goods uh, clients is that uh, dealing with players like Amazon come with their unique complexities and that um, in particular, we see a, a very high amount of revenue leakage. What I mean by that is that, uh, you know, fines and penalties, if you didn't follow exactly their supply chain requirements, your delivery didn't come in the time or form that they expected, or deductions related to trade promotions and, and discounts and so on, those can actually add up to several points of, uh, of revenue. So a very significant amount and often even higher than what we see in some of our bricks and mortar retailers. And so um, a lot of the work we're doing in this area right now is really around kind of creating control uh, towers and analytics and using machine learning to basically identify, you know, which of these kinds of penalties and deductions are appropriate 
versus not appropriate. And also uh, improving your supply chain uh, processes, practices, forecasting, and so on to avoid the penalties uh, to begin with. And that that is a big deal for a lot of our uh, CPG manufacturer clients right now. So, Mike, we've got 40 seconds left. Can I just ask you an open-ended question in terms of what do you think is going to surprise people who aren't specialized in this field in the next, say, 18 months? Mm. I think the proliferation of choice is going to continue to surprise people. I think you have the way that we interact with brands across touch points and emerging technologies, I think will continue to be surprising, whether it's things like voice and digital and AR and blockchain and whatever the next uh, technology ecosystem is, I think that's going to continue to surprise and hopefully delight people like us. <laughs> okay, when well, you nail the timing. All right, well, look, Mike, Alex, thank you so much for your time. And for everyone listening, that concludes day one of the FD Future of Retail Summit. Uh, I guess we'll see you all back here tomorrow. Thank you so much for tuning in and enjoy your evenings.